being able to write something that somebody wants to read is is what writing is about. Like it's not about subjects and predicates and clauses and pronouns and that stuff is is, is important, I guess. But first and foremost, it just needs to be uh, interesting and connect with the reader's brain in the right way. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity. With your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity training trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and how you can get $1,000 off software licensing when you place an order, that's right guys, $1,000 off, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $1,000 off software licensing when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. podcast is brought to you by hituni.com. Hituni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high intensity training qualifications. Hituni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years experience training clients and has supervised over 15 thousand high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a gold mine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So, this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount, discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I, U-N-I, dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course, and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support. Hi guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that teaches you how to optimize your high intensity training protocol and your high intensity training business to help you achieve your health, fitness and business goals. My former guests include people like Ryan Hall, Brad Schoenfeld, Dr. Doug McGuff, Jay Vincent, Andy Galpin, PhD, Noah Kagan, Luke Carson and many, many more. This episode is a little bit different. My guest is David Cadavy. David is a writer and entrepreneur and the author of Design for Hackers, which debuted in the top 20 on All on Amazon. He's been featured in The Observer, The Huffington Post, Inc.com, Quartz, McSweeney's Internet Dependence, T- Dependency, Tendency, <laughs> Upworthy and Lifehacker. 
I love David's podcast, which is called Love Your Work, where he interviews entrepreneurs and creators like James Altucher, Ryan Holiday, Noah Kagan, and Seth Godin. You will love this episode if you're interested in improving your writing and writing output or looking to start a blog. So let's say you're really passionate about high intensity training and you really want to and, and you love writing and you want to start writing about your experience and what you're learning and maybe create some kind of business there. And this will give you some of the knowledge on how you can actually kick that off. We also talk about how to build an affiliate based online business. And we talk about how you can optimize your productivity and figure out when during the day and the week you are most productive and how you can use that time in the best way possible. And David actually asks me, you know, it shows me how I can do that in my life. So we give you kind of a real practical example of that. And we talk about much, much more. So for all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. And don't forget to hang around until the end of this episode for your free gift. And now I give you David Cadavy. David, thank you for coming onto my show. Uh, really appreciate having you on. Thanks so much, Lawrence. I, I'm excited to, to be here. No worries. So first question I want to ask you is, is you have um, a number of professions almost. Uh, you know, you've, you've, you've authored a couple of books, you have set up a few businesses, a few affiliate businesses, various other things. When you were at a party and someone asks you, David, what do you do? How do you respond to that? Oh, I don't, I don't go to parties. <laughs> uh, no. But uh, I guess I, these days I usually just say that I'm an author, which is funny. I only really have one book, but I'm working on a new one. And I, well, I guess I say I'm an author and I'm a podcaster. Because that's what I've been I've been concentrating on the last couple of years is is my podcast, Love Your Work, and then I'm working on a book, which working title right now, Getting Art Done. And I, a couple of years ago, just kind of decided and came to a re- realization that that was what I wanted to do, was to read a lot of books, think about stuff, have conversations, and uh, turn all of that into uh, ways that I can share that knowledge, which happens to be my favorite format, happens to be book, so... Mm. And is that, do you find us where you derive the mo- most joy is from writing more than any other sort of business activity that you might participate in? Is that is that the number one for you? It's a strange type of joy um, <laughs> in that it's it's very painful at times, and it's always a little bit painful. Uh, I mean, it's not always a little bit painful, but getting started is always a little bit painful. But I get I get the most satisfaction out of it uh, is is what I would call it, I guess, is just the, the mental effort of learning things and, and reading very carefully and then processing my own thoughts about those things and, and writing them. It's just something I find very gratifying. Do you still do... I was, I was wondering, like, um, I was listening to Kevin Kelly talk about the importance of divorcing the, um, the, the drafter or the writer from the editor... So like, you know, just doing your first crappy draft of whatever it is you're writing, but not editing as you go and instead editing at the end. Do you follow that kind of formula with your writing? I use kind of a dual strategy. Um, I'm, a, I'm definitely a big advocate of separating the drafter from the editor. I, I didn't really, I hadn't heard Kevin Kelly talk about that, but that's something I definitely try to do. And I try to kind of, if I don't have an editor, which I usually don't, I try to imagine kind of a future version of myself is going to go back over this thing. And so go ahead and and barf it out. Now, that said, I also find a lot of value in shipping and reaching some sort of a completed product. And so I try to make a habit of doing that very regularly, whether it's like a a 100 word article or a 500 word article, or, you know, these days are starting to get longer of just trying to write stuff like that regularly where I just sit down in one sitting and get the whole thing out there. But I I think I'm able to do that now because I've gained a good amount of experience in writing. And so I I can write decently edited prose um, kind of on the fly. But for example, for the book that I'm writing, yeah, definitely. uh, I wrote one draft of it that I published publicly that was 30 different chapters delivered via email and now i just wrote i just rewrote the entire thing in kind of what i call barf mode (laughs) where you just write and write and write and and stream of consciousness on the subject 
and then print it out and go over it and try to put the pieces back together. So, yes, I think that it's very important to keep that internal critic and that internal editor uh, separate. One of the things I really found inspiring was your 100-word article a day strategy on Medium. Um, I, I, I set aside time. I learned this from Noah Kagan, actually. Um, and he says about how he sets time aside for learning and time aside for various things that he's passionate about doing or interested in doing. Um, Because if you don't schedule it, it sometimes it just doesn't get done. And I set time aside for writing and I set this like three hour block aside on a Thursday morning and I never do it. (laughs) I just end up doing business as usual or something probably quite unproductive. And I like the idea of a hundred word article because it's that it's that kind of mini quota just to get you to do stuff, um, which often I imagine results in you writing lo- much longer articles. So can you just tell us a little bit about what inspired you to do that and how often you do that now and, and how it's kind of benefited you? Well, I mean, think about it. If you have a three hour block, I mean, that's pretty overwhelming. <laughs> and not only is it overwhelming, I mean, especially if you're if you are, it depends upon your level of writing, right? Like I, I sit down and write for two or three hours every morning at this point, but I treat it like my job. That's what I do every day. Um, but if, if you just pick a three hour block and say you're going to write during that time, then, uh, it's like there is, it's very easy to fool yourself into thinking that, Oh, I need to, I'm going to just go work on this other thing or I'm going to, uh, you just scan Facebook or something or I'm bored because you've kind of made an unrealistic expectation. You kind of made an unrealistic demand on yourself. So the idea of saying like a hundred word article is, uh, is to, because it sounds ridiculous. It sounds ridiculously easy. Like who can, who can't write a hundred words. And so if you've made the commitment to say, write a hundred word article every day, then it becomes, it becomes a, um, a habit that's almost harder to not do it than it is to do it. It's like brushing your teeth, right? You, you brush your teeth. You you probably would feel pretty crummy if you didn't brush your teeth. It's not so much because you have to brush your teeth, but the, it becomes a habit. You you will feel bad if you don't brush your teeth. And so, if it's a hundred word article, then it's very hard to say like, oh, I can't do it. I've got to go to the grocery store. Or, oh, I can't I can't do it. I just don't have time because this, that, or the other thing. It's harder to make excuses because really, how long does it take? You know, you, you can write something in, in <laughs> you could write something in, in like less than two minutes if you really tried. So I've experimented with different lengths of articles. And, I'm, and I've been somebody who, in the past, I was very skeptical of this strategy of having some kind of a habit for creative output because I just thought, well, then the, the quality is going to suffer. I'm not going to make as well polished work yeah. now um there's a psychologist named dean dean Simnon, simonton who has dedicated his life to studying creative productivity and he's actually found that uh in, in a variety of fields that the the more pieces of output you have the more likely you are to uh, contribute something of significance um so I mean, there's some scientific data to to back it up um, now, are my hundred word articles going to be of, of, of significance? Not necessarily, but they can lead to ideas that can lead to, to, to significance. So I initially experimented with, I, I tried to do a thousand words, maybe a, a day, a couple of years ago. Um, that's something I've heard of a lot of people do, but it was unrealistic. Like writing a thousand words is an accomplishment in itself. Now making a habit of writing, making a habit of sitting your butt in a chair and putting your fingers on the keyboard every day, that's a whole other accomplishment. So if you're able to scale that habit down to something that's so simple that you can't not do it, then you are able to build that habit and then you can you can build it up. So I started with 500 words a day, did that for, said I was going to do it for a week. Then I said I was going to do it for a month. Then that turned into two months or three months and my writing got better and better, started getting noticed 
on Medium, started showing up in other publications. And then by the end of a few months of that, I started to have this grab bag of things that I could mix and match into other larger pieces. So that's what's happening when I'm like work, working on my book. Now, I when I'm working on a bigger project such as my book, I, I go through ebbs and flows where I'm just working on you know, maybe drafting the book or I might take a break and then start writing 100 word articles like yesterday i wrote a 100 word article a 250 word article and then then i was like oh, i'm gonna write another one and that ended up being like a thousand words hmm. um and and that is then taking some of the things that i've been writing about and, and and repeating myself and reconnecting the things and not being afraid to repeat myself because um because you you end up connecting things in new ways so uh, as far as, but then I tried a hundred words during a time when I was, I think it was, might've been when I was writing the first draft of getting art done. I was basically writing a thousand word article or a thousand words a day, thousand word chapter a day for that. And my, uh, so I, I would kind of start the day with a 100 word article. And so it was interesting. I will say though, that there was one weird thing about it was that when I was done with a 100 word article, I had to, I would get kind of a dopamine hit would get a sense of reward of, yeah. of accomplishment like and I would have to, to yeah. yeah. And I would have to kind of wrangle myself in because I'm typically when I, you know, I might get the same dopamine hit from writing a hundred word article as I did for writing a 500 word article that took me an hour and a half or something. And, you know, after that hour and a half article, then maybe I'll go check Facebook or Twitter or something. And, and that's kind of my reward. And so I had sort of been conditioned to, to give myself a reward after feeling a dopamine hit like that. So I found myself having to wrangle myself after those hundred word articles for that. But, but I, I still think it's a, a useful tactic for anybody wanting to get started writing is just pick the easiest habit you can possibly come up with. I think I'm going to do that, you know, because I really enjoy writing, but I never actually do it uh, as much anymore. Like what I, what tends to happen with me is I'll write, I'll, I'll, I'll get some inspiration, you know, out of nowhere. You know how it is. Sometimes it just hits you. And I will sit down to write a post and I'll write a thousand words and it will be complete crap because I'll know, because I'm just doing stream of consciousness and I know I'm going to edit it or I plan to edit it later. And then I never go back to it. So right now, probably in my WordPress, I've probably got like seven, 1500 word posts that are just in a horrible state and don't go anywhere and it's frustrating because maybe if I instead ha maybe I just expect too much uh, when I sit down to write or you know I the, the the task of finishing them is so daunting when actually if I had a smaller quota it, I, I'd actually probably make more progress there yeah look at that um I mean think about how just imagine now pulling up one of those articles right now and trying to edit it and trying to bring it to completion. I mean, just you can, to me, to my mind, I can just, I can, I can remember the exhaustion that you feel in just thinking about doing that. And so you procrastinate, you never get it done. You never pull them out and, and finish them. And maybe you do every once in a while, but I used to have articles that would take me a year to finish them <laughs> because of that. No, but if you if you if you break, there's a couple of things going on there. Where one, when you give yourself a quota and like a word count, I know I noticed this especially when I was writing the 500 word articles, was I was trying to hit like 500 words exactly, and I found that I would. There's these things that you do when you write when you you kind of want to oh add this caveat and of course I don't mean this and all this other stuff, and when you're writing a 500 word article, you find that you just have to rip those things out not that they're not of no value but for a 500 word article they're not they're getting in the way and so um that helps you be more economical with with your words in your writing and um and then and then you know and then it's, it's another problem is that when you write those big articles you might have this big idea but there's a lot of different facets to that I, that idea and so it's fine to write about this, write about the same idea over and over again, and just write it different ways. Like, look at Seth Godin's writing uh, a blog post every day. Like, they're sometimes they're they're overlapping in the concepts that they're writing about. It, it's fine to repeat yourself, and and that's gonna um, that that's going to put the information 
in your long-term memory so it can then be mixed together to make better and better insights. Why did you choose to do it on Medium rather than your own blog? I guess I treat my own blog as a little more sacred still. Maybe I shouldn't, but there's some things about about the way that blog is designed that uh, contributes to that, that also, um, you know, I, I don't have the motivation to, to change. I don't want to re- just redesign my whole blog. Um, so I just started doing it on Medium. It's funny because um, I'm sure I get people asking me about Medium sometimes as if it's something that I take really, really seriously. Uh, <laughs> but the funny, the funny thing is, though, that I is that I don't take it seriously in my own mind. I mean, I think that I think that I've done some of my best writing there, but in my own mind, it's like it's just an exercise. Uh, it's just a testing ground for ideas and medium is a great testing ground for ideas because you get it makes it very easy for readers to give feedback they yeah. can you know hard it which i guess it's claps now they can clap or the highlights are huge because then you get to really see like how do how do your words connect with somebody what are the words that resonate with somebody what, notice the way that a more simple sentence gets highlighted more than if you try to be complicated about it so that's that's why. How do you how do you take use that data? Like, what do you do with that when you get that kind of data? There's highlights. Like, how do you then act on that? It. I just let it sink into my to my long term memory. Um, I might go back over my blog post from time to time, just lazily. It's it's something I could maybe make a habit of, but just sort of lazily, I might go back over things and see. Oh, how did I write about this idea or that idea? And actually, I kind of I kind of do that because I tend to syndicate some of my better articles to to my podcast. Love your work. I'll um, I just that, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll I'll just read it as an essay and present it, and um and then and then I am kind of talking about the same ideas during during my interviews when when a relevant topic comes up, or those interviews inform the. Uh, inform the medium articles too so it's really to me this is interesting okay so creative insights are really just the connecting of various ideas right so um how long did it take we we had wheels for like thousands of years we had luggage for thousands of years Mm -hmm. we were pretty deep into the 20th century before somebody decided to put wheels on the luggage and that was revolutionary and now you you have to connect ideas to to make creative breakthroughs, um, and your long term memory can hold your your short term memory can hold like seven things. Your long term memory can hold like limitless things. So really, it's kind of all about getting things into your into your long term memory. Um, there, I I've read that chess masters can look at a chessboard and like instantly memorize the positions of the different chess pieces. But that only works if the positions of the chess pieces are from a real game, like an actual scenario that could happen or that is common, because they've done so much study. They've, been, they've played so many games. They've done so much studying of strategy and everything. They have a framework in their minds for understanding the game of chess. Now, if, if, you, if you just randomly put pieces on there, then they're not really any better than the average person in remembering where those chess pieces are. So I think about writing the same way in that you are just over and over again exercising these ideas letting them sink into your long-term memory and then reconnecting them in new ways by continuing to generate work over and over again and as you do that your understanding of whatever concepts you're writing about just gets bigger and bigger and bigger then suddenly i mean i've seen it happen with myself where i started to get pretty good at 500 word articles and you know, thousand, fifteen hundred word articles were difficult. Now it's starting to get where, on this subject, the thousand or fifteen hundred word articles, like they're starting to have more structure to them. I'm starting to, to be able to commu- communicate them more clearly. That's just from repetition over and over again, exploring these concepts. Have you ever gone done a writing course or anything like that? No, I never have. You know, it's funny. I hated writing as a child. Um, I. I'm not exactly sure why that is. I do. I do remember one time when I was maybe ten years old. I, 
I, I sit, told my mom, hey, I'm going to write a book. And she took out her beige typewriter and plugged it in. And it was just typewriter days. And I sat down and I like probably like wrote Once Upon a Time. And then I was just like, oh, this is hard. And then I got off the chair and left and went and played with blocks or something like that. And then I never wrote again voluntarily for like 15 years. Uh, so I don't know if I traumatized myself with that experience. It's possible that I did, that uh, I was just aiming too high. Um, but I always, I was, I never really liked writing until I started writing about, you know, whatever it was that I knew or whatever, um, whatever I wanted to write about. It just kind of happened accidentally. But no, I, I've never taken a writing course. Uh, well, actually, maybe that's not exactly true. I've taken a sketch writing course at the second city, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's kind of a comedy, um, academy that has locations around the world that like Tina Fey or Steve Carell or, um, okay. uh, who, well, it, it, pretty much everybody who's been on Saturday night live went through the second city, the second city for their improv right. writing. And then, so I, I took a sketch writing course, um, I've t I may take an improv there too, but but sketch writing. I've taken storytelling, which you know involves some writing as well. So uh, that's the extent of my formal writing training. I don't really know a lot about. I don't really know about what a you know. I don't even. I couldn't tell you what like a clause was, or <laughs> I guess I know what a subject is and the predicate, and you know, you know my spelling is okay, and I've kind of learned some grammar stuff through osmosis, just writing. And I've studied writing through um, you know, reading a book or two here, a book here and there about writing, and then also just doing a lot of reading and and examining it. But um, yeah, I'm not I'm not really a writer in the sense of somebody who understands uh, language, which I um, I mean this will sound judgmental, I guess, but. I, I guess I've I've read too many too much writing by by writers who are writers and they go through an MFA program or something, but they have no idea how to write something that a person wants to read. Oh yeah. Um, so which uh, maybe they're fiction writers or something, which is a whole other thing. I don't even I'm not even really a fiction person, but I think that being able to write something that somebody wants to read is is what writing is about. Like it's not about subjects and predicates and clauses and Semicolons. pronouns and, <laughs> and uh, yeah and, and that, that stuff is, is is important i guess but first and foremost it just needs to be uh interesting and connect with the reader's brain in the right way yeah um just on this on this topic of writing and you know writing short articles and things like that i'm just thinking you know a lot of people that be listening to this as we were talking about before we started recording are you know running some kind of high intensity training business you know health and fitness business or a uh, are interested in doing so uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a you know a personal training studio it could be um you know a youtube channel or a blog um and i just wondered do you still think that in today's world there's a lot of power in someone starting a blog in the fashion we're talking about here like producing consistent high quality written content yeah definitely and actually i would even take out the high quality part <laughs> uh because I think there's a, just a, there's a shipping bias on the internet, and this I mean that's one thing that's been a little disheartening about the whole deciding to write on Medium is that I wrote a lot of crap, and you know some of it was good, which is fine. I guess that, that I've learned that that's that that's what comes along with creativity is understanding that you're just really rolling the dice, and you you don't know what's going to be it. I mean, you know it's going to be, in my case, you know it's going to, you have a feeling it's going to be a hit as you're writing it, but you don't know when you put your fingers on the keyboard what's going to, what's going to happen that day. Um, and so I would say that, yeah, like even forget about the high quality and just make a habit out of it. And then the high quality will hopefully follow, not just because, because you've given yourself something to evaluate, you know, you've put the mound of clay on the table, so to speak so that you can start molding it. And when you have something living and breathing out there, then you suddenly, um, you, you loosen up that part of your brain that was, um, 
being anxious and worrying about making the thing and free that up to then instead look at the stuff that you made and make make the stuff better so i think <laughs> scoping it down like say, say you have a, a gym maybe there's an email list and you just have like a daily tip and it's 100 words long and you, if you give yourself a uh, I, I can guarantee that if, if the listeners give themselves that as a, a prompt and they just try making a list of oh what would i write about they would probably suddenly be surprised how many ideas they had mm. i get the feeling that a lot of those that hear that are like that's a great idea but are worried that maybe they'll say something and they've not got the scientific evidence to support it especially if it's like something to do with muscle gain or fat loss or diet where there's so much debate still on certain topics you know would you I mean, you know, I, I know for me personally, if I read something and I feel like it's not it's not underpinned by a lot of you know sci- scientific evidence or um, that it might be flawed that I, I won't want to continue reading it. Like, how do you advise that people get around that type of issue when it comes to writing or should they just not be bothered about it? Um, yeah, that is tough because I mean, it takes so much knowledge to really comb through all the research and, and even even like you read a research paper and you might think that oh okay this shows this thing and they might not even be expressing their doubts in the conclusion but then you talk to somebody who is an expert on this and who is a, a doctor of it and they're like yeah that study it had these flaws <laughs> to its methodology exactly. and stuff and it's just like it, it's it's uh, it's exhausting. So, I mean, there's things you can say like research suggests or this, you know, you can cite a study here and there. And, and you know, if you want to be, um, if you want to be careful with that, you can say, you know, it's, it's still unknown because this and that and the other thing. But um, it, it depends on who your reader is, too, because um, I feel like some people their eyes will glaze over if you start getting into the complexities that's very true of of things and 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 so i would imagine that as a trainer you you're you're always working with the best information that you that you have at the time um and whatever we know now is going to we're going to know something different so you can do the best that you can i think that another thing to do is to um i it's hard to say with the with the vertical of training but i know with a lot of things people will ask me like ah, how do i start writing like i'm not an expert on anything and i say well then write about that or write about what you learned you know go ahead and put in your writing like i wondered this i read this it suggested this but maybe this and that and the other thing i don't really know <laughs> that's that's an article and and maybe you do maybe you do that every day for a month maybe you do that every day for a year but but as you write that stuff it will add rigor to your thought process and it will cause you to 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 do the re, you know, to it will help make you do the research which is another thing about with the studies and stuff is that if if you are making a habit of writing every day if you've made that commitment and then all of a sudden you could run across something where you're like, I don't know if I can say this, that, or the other thing. Mm. Then, hey, you've made the commitment. That's You've sort of foot in the door to yourself in a way uh, in that um, you made a small commitment. But because you made that small commitment, you uh, go ahead and follow through on this bigger commitment of, okay, let me see if I'm going to comb. I'm going to make some time tonight to comb through that whole article and make sure I understand it before I say this thing. You are right, though, because like what you said about studies is that, you know, if you if you sat over a scientist and went through like a, you know, the methods and the conclusion and everything within any any study, really, um, they'll point out flaws, like you said, and it's it's, it's never ending. No, it's, it's none of it's really that conclusive. So like if if you don't act because there's doubt, then you'll never act at all. Right. Yeah. And and even the studies that are conclusive what there's going to be 10 or 20 years will pass and then we'll find out something else. And it's funny. Some of the, I I, I'm thinking specifically about, um, create uh, studies. I've read about the creative process and the idea of incubation or the idea that as you rest, 
you if you have rest periods you're able to solve creative problems after those rest periods and like there's there's some research on that that's conclusive that seems to be conclusive and then there's some research like there's this idea of okay does your brain work on problems while you are i hope i'm not getting into, into the weeds too much because no, i'm trying cool. to illustrate a different example but your you, does your brain work on a problem while you are sleeping now there's plenty of research that suggests that and there's even some authors who will cite those articles and say that your brain is working your subconscious mind whatever that is is working on uh creative hmm. problems while you're sleeping and then and then there's you know a, a one neuroscientist I know who says, yeah, we're not sure. And because this and that and the other thing, and they're very, um, as somebody who's not a scientist, they sound like kind of hair splitting reasons. Um, but that's, that's what this scientist thinks is that these studies are flawed for this, that, and the other reason. And, uh, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say what to do. It is like, what kind of, what kind of writer do you, do you want to be or what kind of what kind of person do you want to be do you, do you want to do you want to bore people with details do you want to inspire action um or do you want to uh be somebody who's very rigorous and and a certain type of person follows you because of that i, I think that there's some decisions to be made there and and I, I feel like it's really kind of up to the individual and if they are, if they, if someone's listening to this and says, you know what, I want to start a blog, I want to start writing, you know, 50, 100 word, 500 word articles every day or a couple of times a week, um, would you recommend that they start with a platform like Medium or do you recommend that they start their own actual blog? My opinion is whatever can reduce the friction between you thinking about doing this thing and doing this thing. And so for, for, for me, I think Medium is is great for that no matter what like write for a week or write for two weeks or write for a month on there see what how things go you can always put them on some other platform uh, it's too there's i've met too many people i i just met it's just it makes me so sad there's just so many people who are like yeah i'm thinking about starting a blog but you know i'm still thinking about the name i'm not quite sure of like the positioning of it and, and then they, it never happens yeah never happens and it's the saddest thing to me because i because i do believe that so many people if they would just try they they would find that they have something to offer um so i would say that and I would also say another thing that can stand in people's ways is they're just afraid to, to write stuff and put it out there. So one great way of getting over that, and this is something I've done before and I've made a lot of money in this scenario, is make up a pseudonym <laughs> and write on the pseudonym for a while and see how it feels. See what happens. See how some of your fears were totally irrational. See how it feels to have the freedom of nobody knowing who you are you know um and that's that is another way to just reduce the friction as as much as you can that's really good advice um and the pseudonym if you don't mind us talking about this was your affiliate sure. site for match.com is that right that's right yes i uh <clears throat> so i was doing a lot of online dating back in was living in san francisco it was 2007 or something and i was talking to some friends about it i was at south by southwest it was late at night it was 2 a.m or something we were sitting in the on the patio of some closed restaurant and uh i was talking about it and one of my friends was like you need to write about this because i was just kind of talking about like this is what you do you said what you should write in your profile and this is how you should message to make sure you get a response and then this is the point where you should ask them on a date and this is the how you should uh plan the date etc and they're like you got to write about this and i'm like i don't want to be the online dating guy like that just i just don't want that to be my brand that's not what i'm going after and they're like somebody said write a suit just make up a pseudonym go home make up a pseudonym open up a wordpress blog don't even buy a domain and just start writing and that's exactly what I did. I When I got back to San Francisco, I opened up a WordPress blog. I didn't even buy a domain. And then I just started writing. And it was very freeing because it was it was very it was very freeing at first. 
And then it was also nice because I had been writing about so many different subjects. It was nice to write on one subject. It made my writing better because of that. People started messaging me and stuff. And then I ended up getting a domain after then. And then um, by the time I got the book deal for my first book, Design for Hackers, you know, I kind of built a brand as as uh, somebody who wrote about design. Mm-hmm. By that time, uh, this online dating advice blog, written under a pseudonym, started making so much passive money that it was perfect timing because I had just got my book deal. I'd gotten you know a small first time author advance for it. I I needed I needed time to concentrate on writing this book, and then all of a sudden thousands of dollars a month are coming in for this site that I started three years ago. So it, it, it took time. It took three years to start making the money. But but I guess the, the illustration I'm trying to make here, though, is, is that uh, a pseudonym can be a very useful way to, uh, to sort of free yourself of your fears about the horrible things that are going to happen if you write. And it will show you that most of the time the horrible things are not going to happen. <laughs> So just just on that on that business, why do you think it took three years for you start to make serious sales? Was that just search engine optimization or like word of mouth? Like how? Why do you think it took so long? Yeah, I you know, I didn't start it with the um, the goal of making money. I mean, I knew from the very beginning because I I learned enough about SEO mm-hmm. um, through having my blog. I knew enough in the beginning to kind of. Uh, th- think ahead of time about okay what were the keywords i would want to rank for and to think about that um I, I wasn't really trying to make money i guess maybe that last year or so i might have been working on it for a while to try to make money but i think that's the nature of the beast with with seo uh, unfortunately uh is that it just takes a time for google to start respecting your site and uh and i guess i had uh, yeah, I guess I had started getting serious about getting good links and, and things like that not too long beforehand. But, you know, for the, maybe the first year or so, it was really just about, uh, I, I thought it was fun. It was a good way to blow off steam because I was going on a lot of hmm. bad dates and, you know, you just, you, you just go on a bad date and you get home and you, you kind of want to, uh, share share it in some way. I mean, I guess I wasn't, I wasn't writing about dates so much, but I was writing about, you know, how to, how to get the dates and, uh, to, to get emails from people who were like, Oh, you know, this is just been so frustrating, but your writing is helping me. And it's such a, it's just a great feeling. Yeah. Um, it was a nice way to blow off steam for me for a while. And so it just, it turned into something and yeah, I, I never took it super seriously. I could have made a lot more money if I did. I really just, in the beginning, was blowing off steam, and then later on was just trying to make as much money off of as little work as I possibly could, so that I could, um, or make 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 what it took for me to live really off of as little work that it, that it would require, so that I could uh, explore other things that I was more curious about. And just for context of people that aren't familiar with that, um, you were selling affiliate, uh, you were selling people, sorry, sending referrals over to match.com and getting a commission. And that was the only revenue stream. Is that right? That was pretty much it. I mean, I, I, I worked with other affiliates like eHarmony. Oh, yeah. yeah, a little bit here. JDate, I got a little here and there, but no, match.com by far. And actually, from the beginning, I... Uh, I wanted to rank. I knew I was going to be writing. Match.com was what I was using. I knew I was going to be writing about Match.com. Um, and I was aware that they had a pretty healthy affiliate program, even from the beginning, because I knew to go look in Commission Junction. I think I, I think when I started, I knew to go look in Commission Junction and kind of look at the terms and, and say, like, mm, yeah, there, there's some potential here. I, I don't expect... I think there, there's probably a lot of competition in online dating uh, space, but you know, I'll go ahead and it, it's at least an idea that I could that I could write this. And yeah, it was strictly people searching for like Match.com promo code. It would be like hmm. <laughs> the second or third result, wow. you know. So I made as much as 11k in one month nice. off of <laughs> Match.com referrals. It was crazy. That's nuts. Um, 
This is really interesting. I had someone approach me recently uh, asking me about, you know, do I know of a product, an affiliate product um, in the high intensity strength training space? And obviously there's plenty in the high intensity training um, space where that, that acronym is, is defined in many different ways. Um, but from what I know, no one's actually created a, a, a you know, a premium product that is um, about this type of strength training. Um, and there's loads of people who wrote eBooks and loads of people, people sell, you know, consultations online and stuff like that, but no one sold, a, a, you know, or created a, a premium affiliate product. And he was asking me, you know, I want to create an affiliate site and sell that. And I just thought there's a massive opportunity for someone within this niche to create something. Um, and obviously, you know, if, if it were really, really high quality, I would definitely become an affiliate. And just on that, I just wonder, do you still think, like, do you still make a good income from that affiliate site? And do you think that there's still a lot of opportunity for people to start affiliate sites today? I don't continue to make very much money off the site. I mean, maybe a couple hundred dollars a month. I have... I guess, you know, maybe a month ago I went and spent an hour on it trying to, I there were like broken links and, and I, I just went back and fixed a few things to kind of see if things could go back up. Um, but I'm not spending a lot of time on it. I could Why possibly... do you think it dropped? Oh gosh, there were uh, a number of nightmares that I've had in the process uh, over the last few years. One time I got smacked by Google and I, I had all these links that like, um, I mean, truth be told, I had I had bought a couple links, um, and Google was penalizing for that. I don't know, you know, how they knew that. But but on top of that, I had tons and tons of links that were spam links that um, j I had nothing to do with, you know. And so I had to comb through all of those and do takedown requests on all of those to like get back in good standing. And I wasn't necessarily in great standing. Another thing that happened was I was um, I hired a freelancer to migrate the site off of one host to another host, and that freelancer didn't redirect the www to the dot com, um, and so six months went by without me knowing. Which is, I mean, it, it's. Yeah, it's whatever. It's like the freelancer should have known to do that, but uh, I, I, you know, I should have checked. But I, but because it wasn't a high priority for me, I I didn't. I you know, working on the site wasn't a high priority for me. I was trying to just offload working on it, and uh, so so then any any link that had been linking to www um, was dead, and so. Oh, wow. There's a directory called Dmoz. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Dmoz. No. Very, very old school directory, high page rank. I, I don't know why, but I mean, it, it's a terrible directory. It has a, a it historically has a high page rank. It may still. It's possible that it may not. But having a link in that directory is really killer SEO juice. And I had a link in that directory, but uh, after that whole www thing. Uh, my link got dropped out automatically, and then there was no way for me to uh, figure out how to. I, I couldn't figure out how to get it back in there because it's very competitive. You have to. I, I don't know. There's like a, a few. I don't really know how it works, honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing that happened was there was uh, Yahoo had a directory that was three hundred dollars a year that I was paying for a link in that. They closed that directory down. I had a. I had a good categorization in that directory so i think a number of those things cause the seo juice to to sort of wear out that along with the fact that people aren't really using uh match.com as much because there's all these competitors like uh tinder mm. for example who i'm pretty sure doesn't have in a an affiliate program um and is, uh, there's that as well um so the the popularity of Match.com dropping as well as the uh, SEO juice dropping and also me not working on it pretty much at all for uh, several years. But the combination of those things will, will do that, I think.
<laughs> and do you think the second part of the question was do you think there's still opportunity for people to set up affiliate sites all right yes uh, as, as specifically in i mean health and fitness is obviously very saturated um but it's a huge market and, and i think in this particular category that i was talking about i don't think well not from what i understand anyone's doing anything so do you, do you think there's opportunity there um I think that there still is. I do think affil- I think the affiliate landscape seems to be changing. I think that a lot of marketers or companies are starting to come to terms with the idea that managing affiliate an affiliate program is a lot of work and a huge headache. Um, I, I'm seeing affiliate programs change from this platform to the next, or they're shutting down entirely. And I think from what I've heard from people who manage affiliate programs, you know, you're always dealing with people are trying to game the system. They're trying to defraud you of, of money. Um, and so you have to stay on top of that too. So I think that the opportunities are still there. There's still commission junction there. You can go write a niche site on one of these topics and work to build the links. I think it will take a long time because of the nature of, of Google, unless, unless you're somebody who's just really, really good at that sort of thing. Or, or, you know, I've seen people who have, and maybe they have a site, uh, they have knowledge on like how to build a website. And, you know, there's tons of um, like hosting platforms or email providers and all these things to to make affiliate money off of. So I don't know, in the fitness space, there, there could be, yeah, there could be products that are out there already that have some sort of affiliate program possibly that, if somebody writes enough good content, they can uh, they can refer people to that. I, th- I think there's going to be some opportunities. I think that the things that I was doing at the time, for some reason, like not many people had like figured it out. <laughs> uh, it, it, but to me, it was very it was very obvious. I always thought in terms of from the, from almost day one of writing my my blog. It was the idea that, okay, I'm going to write about things that I know that I think are going to help other people, and I'm going to write it in a way that when people search, they're going to find it. So I've always thought that way, and so when I started that site, I was thinking that way as well. And that knowledge has started to spread and become more commonplace, and people are starting to figure out ways to make money. So I think there's there's more competition there. Mm. But yeah, I think our top opportunities are still there, but you better be patient. But it's really nice when you uh, when you get it to work and then you don't have to do anything. I mean, you can go work on something else. Um, that's nice. I think the, the the issue with with stuff like that is is you've got to play almost a long game with affiliate sites these days. Um, you know, it would seem that you have to wait maybe a year or two for your ranking to improve and to really start making sales. And obviously you need to sustain the um, passion for whatever it is you're writing about or creating content for. Uh, if you don't have that, it, from what I can see these yeah. days, it's not a quick win. Is that a fair statement? I think so. I'm, mm. I I think it doesn't take a ton of work either. I think, uh, But I think a person could easily, they could, in theory have a bunch of different opportunities that they were evaluating, put up, uh, you know, work on a site here for a few hours, work on a different site on a different topic for a few hours, work, you know, mm. just kind of put in the minimum viable investment that they can and then let time pass and check in with all those things and pick the winners and kill the losers um, and, and, and double down on it. They, they could, they could do something, uh, something like that. And, and yeah, about passion and interest, too that's that's important i mean if you're somebody who is uh motivated by money it's pretty it's pretty easy i think um for me there was there was really i just wanted to get pay my bills and free myself up to explore other things that i was curious about so once i hit that point i certainly could have made a lot more money if i i imagine if i would have invested in it but I wasn't interested. I didn't. I just wanted to, to pay my bills, spend the rest of my time on something else, and that's that's what I got out of it. And that's, you know, part of, part of the reason why I'm like not making money from that site today. Mm. Cool. So um, you have this other website designed for hackers, and obviously you have a very successful book with the same title. Um, 
And you seem to have a background. You are a product designer. Is that right? Product designer in Silicon Valley? Um, yeah. Web designer. I worked for a couple... Go on. Yeah, I mean, I guess I thought I was a web designer when I showed up in Silicon Valley. I didn't know, I, I didn't had never heard of a product designer when I showed up in Silicon Valley. But uh, I, you know, I guess that my title at one company was like creative services manager. I was managing all the branding and I was managing the website look and feel, and I was uh, developing sales materials and stuff. And then, and then the next startup. Uh, it was doing a lot more interface design. It was a social, uh, it was a social kind of Yelp like site, and I think I said it was the majority. I, I was doing the branding as well, mm. too. And so, um, and I that was where I was starting to have a lot more influence in the in the design of the product and working with the product manager and and using my knowledge of what I had learned and observed over. It, using it was it was like the gr- the golden age of social you know web 2.0 days of silicon valley where it's like all right well how do we use technology to connect people and to crowdsource information and and all of that like back when when that was the the big problem everybody was trying to solve was when i was there i left in uh 2008 right okay um, but you are an expert in kind of typeface and web design in general. Is that fair to say, or is it? Is it? Are you more of a niche expert in that field? I would say, yeah, typography is right. probably my specialty in that area, just because I was so obsessed with it in in college, and then that was always was always trying to find ways to make um, the type that was on the web mm. be appropriate. To being on the web rather than because it's taken a it, it, things have gotten so much better but but print typography and web typography are so different and people uh there were a lot of mix-ups happening or you know in those days in, in those transitional days because hmm. i'm just curious um because I, I when i found out you were an expert in typography i started looking at all of your fonts on your site and your fonts on your logo and and i and i was wondering oh he's probably done every every font that way deliberately um and i just wondered you know how important is that stuff for business you know people who've got online businesses or even things like i was thinking about you know your podcast logo like is that really is it critical to have really effective typography critical and for uh i like critical implies that you 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 couldn't succeed without it i don't believe that um i i think about that stuff and and work on it and i'm lucky enough to be a designer but if i didn't have design skills and i was starting something and i didn't have any money to start it i probably wouldn't invest depending on what it was uh I probably wouldn't invest a lot in design until I was starting to make to make money off of it. Uh, is kind of the way I, I feel about it. Like it's so nice to have. I mean, I mean, people's standards for design have risen so much. So it, I couldn't argue against it being critical. But I also understand that designers are expensive and hard to work with sometimes, and sometimes you just want it's hard to decide to make the investment if you haven't yet decided that your business is going to work Mm. yeah i'm in the process of getting my banner for my website and then obviously that will be the same banner on twitter and facebook and stuff like that um redesigned at the moment to be a little bit more effective and address the change in in business direction and podcast direction that we spoke about um and I'm also thinking that my logo is at the moment it's a it's a rather muscular chap um, with an open shirt and a tie that's off to one side to kind of symbolise the corporate warrior. Um, but I often think, you know, should I have some font on there? Should I have like the corporate warrior title on there? Should I have my name on there? Like, do you think these things are important for like the podcasting logo, for instance? I don't know if I'm moving away from your expertise when I ask you this, but just keen to know what you think. Yeah, I do think these things are important. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're definitely important, uh, and there's definitely a lot of bad podcast artwork out there. Okay. And I don't, um, I mean, I don't, I can't think, of, I, I don't listen to any podcasts that have bad podcast artwork. I don't know if that's... Uh, 
It's like a professionalism I mean, uh, thing. Do you think? You sometimes wouldn't... I do. Hmm. Sometimes I do. If I'm doing a re- if I'm like looking for a specific guest or doing some research for a podcast, uh, I, I might do that. But one, I uh, they. It, yeah, it makes a big difference on the impression. Also, uh, if there's any hope of being featured on iTunes, which I've had my podcast featured like on a big banner with a picture and everything alongside Mark Zuckerberg and RuPaul and yeah. John F. Kennedy and everything at the time, which I can tell you doesn't, it didn't do a ton for my podcast. Um, but if you ever have any hope of being up there, you want to have decent design uh, because Apple's going to be very picky about that. So I think that's an important thing. But I also think that um, I, I end up I, I do see a lot of podcast artwork where people are trying to put too much stuff on there. I think that it's helpful to understand what it's going to look like in context. You know, you can take a screenshot of your category and do a Photoshop mock-up and what does it look like in there? Like if, if everybody else's, uh, if everybody else's podcast artwork is really busy and you make yours just like, uh, very simple with very little on it, then all of a sudden it's intriguing. All of a sudden it stands out. So that's something to think about. Now, as far as imagery as well, you also need to think about the brain and how much information can it process at, at one time. I think that uh, a lot of people will tend to try to put too much detail in something, and the detail is um, like the concept might be uh, it might cause a little bit too much brain processing to to get. So I think in in some ways it relates to the idea of the uncanny valley which is the idea that when you try to emulate humans with, say, a computer, there's an uncanny valley. There's a part where, okay, it's so simple that it's so simplified that you know that it's not, they're not trying to make it look just like a human, and so it kind of looks cool. And then there is super hyper-realism that's convincing, which is very hard to achieve. And then in between there, there's just a part where it just looks creepy, like if you have a computer-generated person and... They're trying to be real, but they aren't. Uh, I think the sim- same similar thing goes for logos or podcast artwork, where there needs to be a certain amount of... Uh, it helps to have a certain amount of abstractness there if there's going to be imagery that's an illustration or something like that. Now, I also think that someone's picture, a good photo with some simple typography, uh, is helpful as well. Uh, another thing to consider is that on most podcast directories... Uh, the name of the podcast is going to show up in the metadata. And, and so mm, why, why even bother putting the name of the podcast on the artwork if there's more interesting, something more interesting to put there? Right, those are all just uh, contours of things to consider. John, it's just occurred to me, I've changed my metadata, my, my tagline from um, health business time optimization to... Uh, high intensity training and and hit business. Changing that would that do you think have affected my ranking possibly? Because I've just seen a dip in downloads, but I wonder whether it was because of seasonal. It's it's you know it's August September. It's holiday so season. So this is in this is in the the name of your podcast. This yeah this would have been on Libsyn. Okay, and uh, I guess I don't want to assume how much knowledge you have about the SEO of, I, of we'll call it iTunes, even though it's Apple podcasts. Sure. Um, not very much. Uh, okay. So there it's very simple. It is, it is very, it's dumb. In fact, it is, it is shameful. <laughs> it is not Google. It is so, it's not even Yahoo 1996. Um, <laughs> it is the name of your podcast when people search it is the name it, it, they search the name of your podcast they search the author tag and they search the title of your episodes so that means that the description of your podcast you can try to put keywords in there not going to affect a thing you can um put the descriptions the descriptions of your episodes you can put all sorts of different stuff not going to affect a thing um 
And so that's why, yeah, on, on my podcast, Love Your Work, it's a little abstract. I have things like solopreneurship, entrepreneurship, creativity, productivity yeah. uh, on there. And that that helps. I mean, I had somebody the other day who said, oh, yeah, I found you in Spotify by searching for entrepreneurship podcast. If it hadn't, I mean, Spotify is probably similar with their search. It's not like How did he get they have like a... Is that automatic? Or? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a whole other that's a whole other deal, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I submitted. Long story short, I submitted. I was rejected. Uh, I the podcast was featured on iTunes, and somebody asked Spotify why I wasn't in the directory, and then they changed <laughs> their mind. So got in Spotify that way, and, and we can talk about that more if you want. But uh, back on the SEO stuff. Um, yeah, it's all it's all very simple. So yeah, that that could definitely affect your ranking. Uh, another thing to consider is keyword density, or even I haven't totally parsed this out, but keyword immediacy. <laughs> I'll use that. I'll make that word up. Um, so for example, like my episode with Seth Godin. If I had episode, I can't remember what the episode number was. I wish I did. Uh, it says episode eighty-three, Seth Godin, and. And then I have some stuff on there about what the episode is about. Well, if I if I cut that down to episode 83, Seth Godin, I don't remember whether my ranking jumps or not. But if I cut out the 83 and just make it Seth Godin, then all of a sudden I'm like one of the top Seth Godin podcasts when you search for Seth Godin. Hmm. So I, I'm a big fan of having numbers in my titles. Um, but for some of my bigger guests that I know people search for, I just remove the numbers and it's just the, the guest name. Um, and, but iTunes with iOS 11, they have new, uh, they have a new feed parameter, which I'm sure that a lot of other podcast apps will pick up where there's a special field. Just, this is probably so boring for your listeners, but hopefully Not they have podcasts, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, where there is a special field just for episode number. And so you have, in your main feed, you got like 83, Seth Godin. And then in your other feed, your iTunes-specific, your Apple Podcast-specific right. feed, it just says Seth Godin, and then there's another field for episode number. So that way, your keywords are more dense. So, Yes, yeah, no, I've seen that in Libsyn, and I, I make sure I populate all of that, just like you said. Um, okay, I want to just check in with you on time. You know, we're, we're coming up for sort of an hour and a quarter. So how are you doing for time? How much time do you have left? What do you want to continue talking for? I, I'm I'm good. I mean, yeah. If you, uh, it, yeah, another half hour would would be my limit. Cool. All right. I will bear that in mind. So, pinged you an email earlier today about productivity or, or what you want to talk about, and you mentioned um, you've got into creative productivity, um, and you've kind of hinted at this with um, conversation you had with that scientist recently about when we are most creative and how much creative energy we have. Do you could you just elaborate on kind of what you've learned in that area in that field lately and and how you've applied it? Yeah, this has been a, a long obsession of mine since I wrote my first book, uh, Design for Hackers. Mm. It was such a traumatic experience for me. <laughs> of writing this book is just you know you sign this contract and then you have this deadline six months in advance, and then until that deadline comes you are constantly, there's constantly this huge to-do item that's just never finished, and it takes over your brain, it takes over your life, and, you know, it was so bad that, like, when my book arrived in the mail, I brought the box upstairs, and I opened it, and I was just, like, didn't even want to look at my book, because I, it, I, it, it, I just suffered so much, like, I just, I just had an aversion to it. I didn't want, and I, and I knew I was going to want to write a book again someday. Cause strangely, I, I thought it was, uh, I enjoyed the process in some ways and I've always been a creator, but I knew I couldn't keep doing it that way. So I wanted to know, um, how could I be creative and make th and solve creative problems without, having to obsess over things without being creatively blocked without having to bang my head against the wall for 12 hours a day just to get that 15 minutes of flow or something. So th that's what something I've been looking at for like the last uh, almost seven years now. So what I found is that 
most of us approach creativity all wrong when we have something like so we want to write a blog post or we want to uh, design a logo or something first of all we aim way too high there's this whole concept of the gap that ira glass from this american life has presented which is the idea that you're always going to envision your work to be way better than what you're actually able to produce or not necessarily always but definitely in the beginning and so that can either intimidate you from starting or you can let go of that and try to be in the present and keep on doing a huge volume of work and, and let yourself get better and, and understand that you are doing that to yourself, that you are imagining this thing that's completely out of your reach. So that's one problem that we, that we often bring upon ourselves. Another is that we, write, we try to reach a creative solution too quickly on on big problems that maybe it's a blog post where you're trying to make a complicated argument or or a, a book you know it can take weeks months years for that information to really solidify in your brain and for those connections to be made I and mean, we've talked a little bit about the idea that insights uh, insights by by their definition really are, are the connecting of disparate elements and it's it's literally different regions of your brain that uh I mean, this is this is an oversimplified way to think of it, but that are storing different types of information. They're talking to each other, and and something collides, and that results in this great idea. And so you have to have that information in your brain. It takes time for it to get in there. Uh, you, your memories need to consolidate. Uh, there's a uh, there's a thing called fixation forgetting, which is uh, proven, which is that. When you sit down and look at a a creative problem, a complex one, you're likely going to come up with some some bad ideas, some weak connections, some things that are kind of dead ends. And through incubation, through sleeping, through disconnecting by leisure or working on something else, then you start to forget those bad connections. And then what's left are the the, good, the better connections. So. That, there's like a four stages. There's preparation, uh, incubation, illumination, and verification for every idea. So you're preparing, you are collecting all the information you can possibly come up with, and then there is incubation, you're disconnecting from it, and then there's illumination, that's what, that moment of insight, which is very hard to predict. And then verification is, okay, does this idea really meet up to my standards? Now, you can't necessarily just sit down and go through those stages. You have to live your life throughout all of that. And, you know, there are ebbs and flows to your creative energy. People have a time of the day, tend to have a time of the day where they are more creative. Um, for a lot of people, that t tends to be the morning. The reason being that a lot of people are not that alert in the morning. The reason being that your internal critic, which is, you could say, was your frontal lobe. The, your, your frontal lobe, the CEO of the brain, the one that is checking to see if ideas are good and 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 helping us plan and all that. It's kind of out to lunch in the morning. It's kind of out to lunch during our not-so-alert time of the day. And that's why, counterintuitively, we can do better creative work when we are a little groggy, maybe before we've even had our coffee. Um, there's a study, um, there was a study done at, uh, uh, I think it was a neuroscientist in Italy, with patients who have frontal lobe damage, which is not something you want. Um, but these patients with frontal lobe damage solved insight problems more readily than normal healthy patients. That's because their frontal lobes are kind of are out to lunch. They're, they're damaged. They're not um, filtering ideas and deciding ah this this is not a good idea before it really gets a chance to to be um, to be put out in the world. So this is something to take advantage of is to 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 get an understanding of when your most creative part of the day is, and to continuously roll the dice creatively during that 
time of day. And then also there's patterns for your week too. You know, a lot of us are me personally, I like Mondays, um, cause I like my job. So I have the most energy on Mondays, uh, Friday, Thursday, Friday, uh, it's better time for like a podcast interview or something because that something that doesn't require me to, uh, think so hard <laughs> or, you know, paying bills or sending invoices, things like that later on, uh, later on the week. So there's, there's your daily ebbs and flows and there's your weekly ebbs and flows. And you're trying to get these ideas, uh, you're trying to get the source material for these ideas into your brain so they can incubate, so you can have those creative insights, and you're continuing to roll the dice to give yourself chances to have those creative insights. Um, and then eventually, you can kind of work to dividing up your work into what I call the seven mental states of creative work, which is the idea being that when you are sitting down and, and it's really a similar idea to thinking of yourself as having an editor, a future version of yourself. That's the editor. And right now you're just writing the garbage. Um, there are times when you want to be exploring things, but exploration, you know, surfing the web or reading books, like that can be a form of procrastination. There's times where you want to research things. There's times where you want to polish things. There's times because prioritizing things, doing the prioritization type thinking uses that frontal lobe um, that does that's really good at planning that's also very energy hungry because because it's so energy hungry of a process it's much better to dedicate uh, GTD GT readers will be familiar with the idea of a weekly review dedicating time to planning your week so that throughout your week you can be present in the moment and you aren't using extra um, mental energy towards trying to decide what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also the idea of ad administrating things, you know, keeping the nuts and bolts of your life and your work moving so that uh, in place so that you don't have to deal with them when you're trying to be creative or revise or polish your creative work. So that is a very long, possibly complicated explanation of all the things that I have uh, observed over the last seven years. No, it's very interesting. And I, I read some of your Medium articles about this. Um, why do you think it is that you're shit hot on a Monday to Wednesday, let's say, creatively, and then not so much on a Friday? Because I, I understand... I mean, I'm a, I'm very much a morning person. I'm most effective between the hours of like eight and twelve, and and I kind of follow that kind of maker manager schedule where I do the creative stuff in the morning and then the admin in the afternoon. Um, but I don't find that differs on a Monday versus a Friday. So why do you think that is? Because that's I think that's quite unusual. Oh, really? You don't feel any different? Uh, no, I don't think so. I could be fooling myself. And you and you don't you don't work on different things on Mondays and say Fridays. Uh, at the moment, um, probably, I don't, uh, I'm trying to think now what I do on those days. What's, what, what's your highest priority? Also, this, this podcast is my full-time thing. So, um, I try and do two episodes a week. So Monday and Thursday are my publishing days, um, Although now, so it used to be that I'd have to put in, you know, you know how it is, sort of six to seven hours to edit and do the blog post and everything else. But mm -hmm. I now outsource a lot of that work. So actually now it's it's more the, the marketing, which is much less work. But those are the most important uh, activities for the week. Um, you know, ultimately putting consistent, good content out there. Um, yeah. So yeah, Mondays and Thursdays. But the reason I do that schedule isn't from an energy point of view. It's from a frequency point of view. Um, and I have no idea whether or not that's optimal. Um, I just don't want to do like one on a Monday and one on a Tuesday because I don't want the listeners to be like, oh, I, I, you know, stop stop releasing so many. Uh, you know, I want to be able to tick them all off and this is too overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, could, that's interesting. Yeah. This is interesting. So, I mean, this is interesting to dissect. So, are uh, what would you consider your most uh, the part of your work that requires the most creative energy? I'd actually probably say this now because things have. Yeah, actually, because to be honest, the the editing and even if I were still doing that work, that is very much 
it doesn't create it doesn't require a lot of brain power right um so i would actually say the podcasts probably require the most brain power for me so the conversations themselves yeah trying to create a good um uh, trying obviously direct the conversation the right way trying to ask great questions trying to just sort of you know deploy active listening and all of that so yeah, yeah. i'd say that is probably the most important thing to be it's, honest it, it's interesting though i i mean i certainly um I personally, when it's my creative peak, is not a good time for me to interview somebody for a podcast because I want it to be when I'm alert. And in my case, I want to have already loaded a lot of stuff into my long-term memory, and I've got my notes. And so it's like trying to form the conversation into what I had planned, but also trying to be present in the moment and alert. So what about what about um, the research? Like you've obviously done a lot of research before this um, before this podcast interview. You know, when did you do that? Yeah, that's a good question. I love this. This is like um, free consultancy for me. So um, <laughs> so I I was preparing for this. I so I was listening to podcasts you'd done over the last sort of few weeks. So I guess you could call that kind of preparation. And I'd if I heard you say something or someone says something i thought oh that's interesting i'd write that down in evernote on a note called david Cadavid. and wait what, what what were you doing uh while you were listening to the podcast oh just i only really listen to podcasts normally when i'm cooking or when i'm walking mm-hmm. somewhere um and so as you're cooking maybe you hear some you're you're, you're you're cooking you're paying attention to cooking you're listening to the podcast kind of you're not listening as as intently as you would if you were like just sitting there listening to a podcast which would actually be kind of hard to do um but and then you hear something and then you you go ahead and make a note in evernote yeah that's what i do or 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 sometimes on paper but typically i i'll have a note for each show and i'll just i'll kind of do you know i'll just do sort of almost stream of consciousness bullets on a note and then i organize them later in the actual before the actual interview but um this morning I did a more of a thorough kind of research or sort of preparation for this show. Um, and I have a checklist. So I've created check, you know, inspired by checklist, checklist manifesto by Atul Gawande. I try and create checklists for all the stuff that's repetitive in the business. Um, so I have like, you know, the first bullet might be put, uh, reach out on social via buffer to ask everyone what they would like to ask David, you know? Um, and then the next, next action might be review you know, all YouTube content or select selected YouTube content and blog articles. And, and it's like about like 10 points that I go through. Um, so I did that today, but come to think of it, I wonder whether I should, that, that perhaps would actually be the thing that I should be doing in my creative time. I don't know. Um, I, I, I guess I can, uh, I'll, hopefully I'll get to that. Yeah. Um, but I, there's more stuff that I'm curious about. How long ago did you start doing research? Like say, listening to podcasts, podcast interviews for this in preparation for this interview? Well, I guess I did it oh, quite a while ago. So probably like six weeks out. Um, I started just, yeah. but it was, it was more, I was listening to the episodes out of pleasure and then just taking notes haphazardly. Um, sure. but the real, you weren't deciding, but you weren't deciding, you usually weren't deciding in the moment, like exactly what questions you were going to ask. Correct. Um, I imagine that maybe you did a bit of listening. You would take a note. Oh, that part's interesting here. That part's interesting there. Time passed weeks passed. In fact, you had plenty of uh, sleep. You you had plenty of incubation time where you were working on other things. You had some weekends in there, and during all that time, your memory was consolidating so that so that instead of in the moment when you are listening and you're trying to remember, the, you're you're trying to remember what you just heard so you can write the note, and it's in your short term memory where you can only hold so many things. Then over time, bits and pieces about what you know about me or what you might want to ask end up in your long-term memory over, over that time. Um, and, and then I imagine there was a, there was a period of time where you maybe you brainstormed a little bit about what's kind of the arc of the conversation, what, what it will the main thing be. Is that right? So all of that synthesis happened today. So all of the kind of um, putting stuff into, so I try to, I try to implement the kind of just in time, 
methodology. I just find that's more productive for stuff like this. Um, so I actually, yeah, sort of planned the 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 show. This is very meta. <laughs> Plan the show and um, prior, uh, yeah, on the same day. I won't always do that. Sometimes I do it the day before, or maybe a little bit, uh, maybe forty eight hours before. But it gen, gen, tends to be the day before or the morning of. Well, which which works? I mean, one, you've been doing a lot of podcast interviews, so you've probably gotten better and better at preparing for them. Two, you started programming the information into your long term memory a long time ago, and so they were the, yeah. the things were kind of there for you to make connections. But one thing that 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 might have worked, something something that I like to do, is maybe like a few days beforehand, if I have the luxury of that, do some brainstorming of like just bullet point questions. And then as things get closer, I, I'll, I'll kind of do things the same the the day of as well, where I physically write the questions in my notebook so that they're ready to go. But then usually that's like from my bullet point list of maybe stream of consciousness or bullet point list things that I've done a few days in advance. So they've had a little bit of time to solidify. So that way I have a little more clarity the day of when I'm uh, pre- okay. prepping for the interview. Yeah, I mean... I do. I, I used to be really, literally, like uh, plan a ton of questions and make the questions really sometimes, you know, incredibly long. Um, and then I'd end up kind of reading off the screen, and the interview would feel less authentic. And I try to now follow a much more of a, a like you know, keyword type planning where I, I just have to look at a few words and I remember the context of the question um, and that's what I've done in this instance so try, trying to also create a little bit more um, of a free-flowing conversation and more uh, what's the word I'm looking for kind of serendipity in the conversation as opposed to it all being scripted like sure. trying to foster that naturally. So that's kind of what I've learned, I suppose, doing this. And I still so, so much work that I can do to become better at a better podcaster for sure. Yeah, I mean, it gets, it's so easy. I know that it happens to me all the time where I'm listening to a podcast and I realize, oh, they, they just said something golden that I should have followed up on, but I was too busy <laughs> thinking about my next question. And, you know, darn it. So, I'll, I mean, I try to punish myself too much over that stuff, but I kind of maybe I'll make I might even physically make a note of like, oh, here's some questions I could have asked here and there so that, you know, just get in, in, improve it over time. Now, back to this idea of what you would do with your best creative time, uh, I would guess that those the, the creative time with which is sort of uh, kind of your low point of the day when you have the opportunity to have more I- ideas um I, that might be a good time to brainstorm new ideas of things you can do to expand your business you know they're not things you're going to do but you're just giving making a a ritual out of it i can think of james altucher's idea of 10 ideas a day that would be a good time of day to do that Another time might be I don't know if you, I don't know if you write detailed show notes or not or if you kind of review conversations and and review what you've learned so that you can write blog posts and things that would be to me I think that would be a good time of day for for that sort of stuff but um, it's not like I say it's certainly not a time of day that uh, I personally would want to be doing podcast interviews um, or you know giving podcast interviews but uh, and it's not necessarily the time of day that I would want to be brainstorming question. I, I might have done some brainstorming questions during that that period of the day, but there's but for me there's just other things that take priority over that. Um, yeah. So now the idea of of uh, the weekly the weekly uh, ebbs and flows of like Monday versus Friday and stuff. I don't know. I I I wonder. It's it's possible that that yeah your energy. You don't run out of energy. You don't run out of the creative energy. It, it might depend upon how hard you're pushing yourself on the creative part of your business. Mm. Um, that's one possibility. Um, one possibility is that it, you don't have that problem at all. Another possibility is that if you were to try it, you might find that it uh, that it works well for you. Um, one, I mean, one of the things is not simply that the changes in energy levels are so different. One of them is, is also that I get a lot of value out of dedicating Monday 
to writing or whatever my most important project is, which at this time is is writing, uh, because if my mind wanders during the inevitably uh, uncomfortable parts of trying to do creative work, if my mind wanders to, oh, I need to uh, invite that podcast guest or, oh, I need to, uh, you know, look for the the best parts of this podcast interview that I did, then I can immediately say, uh, no, it's Monday. You don't work on your podcast on Mondays. Um, so it creates a, a, a sense, a, more of a sense of urgency in that it's Monday. I've got to make the best of this because Tuesday I've got to work on this other stuff. Uh, so there's there's that too. It's it's not strictly a a, a mental energy thing, it, but for me it is. I, I do I do notice the difference myself, but it's also something that I that I observe very closely. I'm not sure how closely you observe that. Yeah, um, no, it's really interesting. I I think I could experiment with with some of that stuff, and uh, yeah, like I think there could be value in like you know setting date. Like I do I do kind of do that. I, I mean I only so I I only record episodes on tend to record episodes on Monday and Tuesday, as you know. <laughs> from our email exchange um but you know yeah because we had to we had to change it to because we were at at a a stalemate because (laughs) monday and tuesdays are like my super high priority creative days during this time like if i'm doing a book launch things might might be different and so Mm -hmm. thursdays are like a more social time for me i got up this morning my i didn't have a great writing session and kind of like tapped out but i can have conversations i can be social and stuff so uh <laughs> thursday afternoon is a great time for me to to do a podcast interview it's funny do you think like in this whole game if you want to call it a game or this business is um it's it's like you know at the end of the day david you're you far more high profile than i am so i'm going to work around you right and like um and you know if 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 it were i don't know I'm trying to think Seth Godin or someone like that uh, I had an opportunity with, then I would happily wake up on 3am on a Saturday morning to interview him. However, if there's someone who I don't want to say is lower than me, but you know, isn't perhaps going to benefit the, somebody who wants the, to market something. Yeah. Right. You know, someone who is not maybe as hard to get or is going to have as much of a beneficial impact on me or the, my business, it, they're going to have to work around me. Do you think that hierarchy plays itself out all the time? in this yeah i think it i think it it's definitely like does but I, I think about. it changes i think it changes to be like i said if i was in the middle of a book launch right now uh and i wanted to be on your podcast for the sake of marketing that book and at, yeah. at the right time then i would do whatever time you wanted uh con- conversely yeah there's there's um high profile high profile people that i've tried to get an interview with and and uh it doesn't the other times don't work for them and then it turns out uh, it's like okay Tuesday afternoon you know Tuesday morning or Tuesday something like that then I'll go ahead and 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 make make the compromise in that yeah. case uh, and I think that the conversation that you and I had it actually goes perfectly along this because I, I maybe I didn't uh, maybe I didn't mention this I don't know or maybe it didn't but you I did you did yeah you said maybe, you or I might have book. said like hey you know we can do it you know I might have said oh we can do it now. Uh, but we'd have to do it on like a Thursday or we can wait until I'm launching the book and then, and then it's, you know, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, no, you did. You said exactly that. And uh, no, and I appreciate the, the way you, you managed it. Um, right. I've got one more question I want to ask and then I'll, I'll wrap up because I know, I know you need to get on. Um, just really interested in your view on this. So I, I tried implementing getting things done in my life um, a few years ago, and I, I tried doing it to the letter, and, and, and it did, didn't work for me. Uh, not, obviously, the whole point of it is you're supposed to kind of mold it to your own your own way of working. Um, but I did, I, did, I did keep a few of the um, methods and ideas that I still use today. Uh, I think the idea of writing it, something down and not keeping it in your head is, is an obvious one, a fantastic way to, to um, store ideas and, and you know, remember things. But... I find doing the in-tray method that uh, David Allen advocates, I struggle to actually clear it. So quite often every week, there's this huge list of items and it does get to me and stress me out knowing that that list is not 
sorted you know i haven't gone through that workflow of if it's two takes two minutes or less deal with it if it's crap discard it sketch it in the calendar blah 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 and i wonder do you have a list do you use an entry of some kind and if so how do you organize that and sort that in your own life i actually just started re-implementing that because i reread getting things done in preparation for interviewing david allen for my podcast and that book just changed my life all over again. You know, it was just so freeing to be on top of things and have now I've got like, a. I use Evernote and each notebook that I have in Evernote has an inbox, but that can get a little messy because then there's a whole bunch of different inboxes, but they're not inboxes for actionable stuff. Usually unless it's a project that I'm very active on and I can trust that I will view that inbox. But I have, an, I have a notebook called Inbox now with a note called Inbox. And I just put things in there. Like uh, whenever I realize that I'm kind of mulling something over, or like, oh, when am I going to do that? I'll just put it in, the, in that inbox. And then I, I'm not very, um, I'm not super disciplined about reviewing it very regularly, but it, it is something that I'll do when I'm kind of feeling bored or, feeling like I should be doing something, but I don't know what to do. I'll just go in the inbox and then, oh, cool. All right. Well, this is a someday maybe, and uh, I can do this right now. And this is what I'll do after that. Um, or, or I'll put this in this other list so that I know that I can get around to it. Uh, another thing is that in my weekly review, I have a checklist. I, I use checklist too. A checklist of things I do in my weekly review. And one of those things is to, is to review that inbox. So at the worst, I'm supposed to look at it every week but I tend to do it a little more often than that. However, I'm not as disciplined at it as maybe I should be, which might be that, oh, a buzzer goes off at 4 p.m. every day, and I go through it, and, and uh, that's not, it's not what I'm optimizing for, right? So I'm optimizing for creative, original, thought-provoking work, and, yeah. and uh, that takes precedence. That, that, that takes uh, priority, over getting things done sometimes you know <laughs> well you are getting things done you're getting the important stuff done i suppose um because at the end of the day there's an infinite number of things we could be doing and it's trying to minimize that to a degree um and i yeah i just find it for me it's interesting what you say because if you see a big long list in your notepad of your your entry does that not and then you don't deal with that. Does that not like annoy you or get to you in any way? A little bit, <laughs> but I've neurotic? gotten better at. Uh, I think I've just gotten better at triaging it, and it's it's a uh, it's like learning a new language. You know, I live in I live in Colombia, the country. They speak Spanish here. You know, mm -hmm. I've lived here for a couple of years, and I learned Spanish bit by bit. It's not something I learned overnight. I think in getting things done is the same way uh, in that you, you maybe you have tools to, to, to start with and then eventually your brain starts to kind of do things uh, automatically. So because I operate with that weekly schedule and that weekly ebb and flow and I kind of use an, an ideal week, which is an interesting concept if you look up Michael Hyatt's uh, ideal week he's got a great blog post on that and a template and everything okay. and because i i work with that there's always i almost always know where something's going to go so if it's a personal thing i'm probably not going to do it during the week at all it's going to go in my um weekly review file for me to take care of on sunday afternoon uh if it is an administrative thing like i need to send an invoice or pay an invoice um, then maybe I'll set uh, an email in Boomerang to hit my inbox a Thursday afternoon at 3 p.m. or Friday afternoon, uh, you know, whatever feels right for the way that that week is going, so that um, it's not going to bother me on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Uh, so that's part of the beauty. I, I, I got this idea. Um, I should give credit. I got, got this idea from Ari Mizell. Oh. who uh you know has this idea that each time i think he goes really hardcore with it like each week you're doing the same thing at the same time every week 
And that way, you know, your email is your to-do list and all you're doing is sending follow-up CC emails or boomerang emails to yourself all the time. And as they come in, you're, you are attending to them. I'm, I don't take it that far, but I at least, um, it, th- that getting rid of the anxiety is, is really just tr- having a p- place for things to go. And when you keep that in mind, then when you feel the anxiety, you can look at it and be like, okay, what's going on? Why, why am I feeling this way? Yeah. Okay. It's because this item, like what, what are my thoughts about this item? I'm thinking that I'm going to forget. And now that's why this item is worrying me. Okay. Well, how can I not forget? Um, well, I could, I, I could set a reminder for myself. So this is a great hack. You pick, you pick up your iPhone or whatever dictation you have. And on an iPhone, you can say, Hey Siri, um, remind me at 3 PM on Friday, to uh buy hair tonic because i know that i'm going to be by the uh the place where i buy hair tonic or whatever (laughs) and you know and and things like that where you just you just have it's it's all about the trusted system if you feel anxiety you aren't you don't have a trusted system and that's where you you have to examine your own thoughts about the things that are on your list and and find a way to to make it a system you can trust yeah, and sometimes I get too caught up in um, I this works for this person, so therefore it should work for me. And I don't want to try and create something new because it might not work. <laughs> when that's kind of foolish because and contradicts a lot of the things I say on this podcast, which is that you have to. I'm starting to learn that you really do have to find things that work for you, and for, it, it's different for everyone. There are just kind of yeah, principles you have that to give- work for everyone you have to give yourself that permission Mm. and i think that's that's it just remind yourself every once in a while like oh i can do it however i want yeah and it's easy to forget that i must ask you this last one which is from a listener um which is about you talking about um you learning spanish yeah he was asking your audience is uh english um for the most part, I believe. Um, but you live in Colombia. So what percentage of the average day do you spend interacting in English? And what percentage do you spend interacting in, in, in Spanish? Uh, I spend most of my day not interacting at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't spend a ton of time physically around people. Um, I spend a lot of time writing. That's in English. I spend a lot of time online. That's in English. Uh, hang out with my girlfriend several uh, several hours a week that's in spanish she doesn't speak english and then i go to uh go to restaurants a few times a week that's spanish so i'd say of the time that i'm at, of the times that i'm actually interacting i would say 70 english 30 Depends on what you. What, this is. It, it's, I'm making it too complicated. Depends on what you consider interacting, but yeah, uh, seventy thirty. <laughs> Just to simplify it. Cool, um, David. What's the best way for people to find out more about you and what you're up to? Uh, follow me on Twitter at Cadavy. Uh, you podcast listener, you listen to podcasts. Listen to my podcast. My podcast is called Love Your Work. I've interviewed. People like David Allen, James Altucher, Dan Ariely, and a huge line of people whose names don't start with A. <laughs> no, it's a great podcast. Honestly, as we were talking about earlier, that's how I came across you. So no, for everyone listening, please do check it out. And uh, we haven't really got time to, to go into the podcasting side of things as much, uh, but perhaps we will in a part two. Who knows, David? Um, so for listening for the show notes and resources and everything david and i mentioned uh, on this episode and for access to all of the episodes please go to corporatewarrior.org and until next time guys thank you very much for listening 
I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com to get your free ebook with six interview transcripts with some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill De Simone, on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are not verbatim, deliberately. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corpwarrior.com, that's C O R P warrior.com, and enter your email address. Then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link. Once you click the link, you will be instantly redirected to a PDF version of the transcripts. I hope you enjoyed. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all in one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity training trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and how you can get $1,000 off software licensing when you place an order, that's right guys, $1,000 off, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $1,000 off software licensing when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. This episode... This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and is supervisor of a 15 15,000 high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high-intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course, so this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high-intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount, discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW in the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course, and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support.